Hey guys, and welcome to the Working Money Channel. Oh jeez. Oh jeez. All right, I got Bitcoin here on the daily, and uh, you know, over the last several days, we have seen nothing but bearish movement uh, for Bitcoin. This, of course, has taken the rest of the altcoin market down with it. Um, so with regards to Bitcoin, let's take a look at the Bitcoin chart real quick here. I was talking about Bitcoin and other altcoins the other day, and whether it's a bullish move or a bearish move, what we tend to see is, uh, you know, price just kind of fluctuate in zones. Now, when we look at charts, I know there's this idea that there's a magical number that if, you know, a cryptocurrency goes below or above, we're in a certain situation. If Bitcoin goes under a certain price, well, that's it. Now we're in a bearish market. We have to be a little bit lenient with this because, you know, if I pick $30,000 for Bitcoin and it goes to 29,900 or 29,500 or even 28,900 and then it rebounds back up, we would likely want to consider this an anomaly. And so we have to be a little bit lenient with this. Right now, Bitcoin is still just hovering in this zone. Now we we know it did wick down uh, back in uh, mid-May. We did see that Bitcoin price wick down to about 29,900, give or take. Uh, that fell directly in line with what we saw here back in January. Uh, from there, it did come back up. So it did wick down here. It came back up and then just kind of has been vacillating ever since, trading sideways. Of course, today we did see this long bearish candle to the downside. And so Bitcoin right now trading at about $31,700. This is getting people a little worried. Of course, this has brought other cryptocurrencies down with it, namely XRP. XRP right now trading at about 65 and a half cents. Uh, but guys, let's not forget back in mid-May, XRP did wick down to about 65 and a half cents right in and around here. So we are just kind of touching that mark right now. Um, this is really going to be the moment of truth. Now we've got to remember, all right, XRP did vacillate. It did go as high as about 80 cents or 78 cents back in November, but we can see that it did vacillate in this, what I would like to call a zone. It did even go below that, but came back up here before we really did see a strong move down uh, when the SEC lawsuit was mentioned. This would be considered another level of support or demand zone, as I like to call them. Those terms are interchangeable. Demand zone, level of support, supply zone, level of resistance. And so I just wanted to point out that, uh, you know, despite the fact that XRP is now hovering at 65 cents, a little scary, we are still vacillating in this zone. I'm really kind of curious to see what happens uh, at this point in time. Now I can see it's already going up a little bit, up to 66 and a half cents. But again, guys, we also have to remember that these coins are reacting to Bitcoin. So the fact that this is happening with Bitcoin is really having an effect on the rest of the market. If Bitcoin saw a reversal and shot right back up, I'm confident to say that we would see the same for XRP and other cryptocurrencies. Now we got to pay attention to the narrative that's going on because, you know, there has been this big push now that CBDCs are on the table, this big push to kind of move the focus away from Bitcoin and uh, towards central bank digital currencies. So this from Lord Vendetta here on Twitter, crypto and blockchain are revolutionary, but we must solve the energy consumption problem. This was an article published by Crypto News Flash. Uh, and here are some pointers. The United Nations now, so the UN, have voiced their support for cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology as a way to liberate millions across the world and work towards a better future. However, despite all the promise the technology holds, the UN believes that the challenge of energy consumption must be solved first before it brings down the entire industry. So now the UN is chiming in on this and, uh, you know, towing the party line, so to speak, getting on board with Bitcoin to energy consumptive. And, uh, you know, this is definitely not going to be the future of cryptocurrency adoption around the globe. The international body identified the promotion of sustainable development as one of the benefits of blockchain and crypto. Here's what they stated. One of the most useful aspects of cryptocurrency, as far as the UN is concerned, is transparency. Because the technology is resistance to tampering and fraud, it can provide a trusted and transparent record of transactions. This is particularly important in regions with weak institutions and high levels of corruption. So uh, that is just another point that the UN highlights. Let me just go down here. Additionally, blockchain can lead to great advances in the field of environmental environmental protection. Not only can blockchain be used to monitor and thwart environmental harmful activities, one project is turning reductions in greenhouse gas emissions into a cryptocurrency that can be bought and sold, providing manufacturers and consumers with financial incentives to make more sustainable choices. So the UN, as well as the IMF, and we've also heard it from the World Bank, all focusing 
on renewable energy, environmentally friendly solutions when it comes to cryptocurrency, and uh, you know, kind of putting Bitcoin in a political corner here, uh, UN energy consumption is the greatest hurdle. So the UN referred to reports that claims that Bitcoin alone uses more energy than entire countries, with fossil fuels still responsible for the production of a sizable percentage of global energy. Bitcoin mining can be said to be partly responsible for the production of the greenhouse gases that cause climate change. So the UN jumping on board with this climate friendly initiative. We also have the ECB guys and this just recently out uh, from XRP Crypto Wolf. Fabia Panetta thinks a government run digital euro would preserve people's privacy unlike Facebook's backed DM stable coins. So this coming from Decrypt, ECB executive board member Fabio Panetta believes a digital euro would preserve privacy better than a stable coin issued by Facebook. If the central bank gets involved in digital payments, privacy is going to be better protected because we are not like private companies, he told the Financial Times in an interview published today. We have no commercial interest in storing, managing, or monetizing the data of users, unlike Facebook. And so last month, Facebook backed DM Association said a pilot version of its stablecoin, a private digital currency pegged one-to-one -to, -one to fiat currency, is on its way. Panetta described DM coin, formerly called Libra, as an unstable coin, according to the Financial Times. By contrast, the ECB's digital euro would be a central bank digital currency. It's still a tentative plan, according to the ECB president, Christine Lagarde. It could take at least four years. Working out how to design the coin would take two years alone, said Panetta. So they are already kind of pushing this idea that so th so first of all there's the environmental part of this but also since the space has evolved so much they also don't want big companies big business to get involved in national monetary policy so the european central bank saying okay uh, we have the technology. We want to be able to preserve our customers' privacy. Let's go with a CBDC that was created by the government rather than going with coins created by private businesses. So what the media is conveying to us is that there's a little bit of uncertainty in the market, a little bit of fine tuning that needs to take place, right? You know, the world was on board with Bitcoin when Elon Musk was tweeting out those tweets about Bitcoin, pro Bitcoin, Tesla was going to adopt Bitcoin. Then there was the big shift. Now we're getting the sentiment from, uh, you know, bodies like the UN, the World Bank, the IMF, the ECB as well, although uh, this article was not so much about energy consumption, but just about uh, private versus public stable coins. We have this narrative shifting, and I have a feeling that this is what's creating a lot of this uncertainty right now. This is why we're seeing Bitcoin price plunge, and this is why other cryptocurrencies like XRP are taking a bit of a bath with it. Now we also have this guys from Michael at Val5 links here on Twitter. Apparently the Bank of France has now tested the digital currency based securities settlement protocol. The Bank of France has completed the central bank digital currency pilot for security transactions in collaboration with Swiss crypto bank SIBA. So we heard news of this earlier this year. Uh, and just today on Monday, the bank officially announced the successful completion of a CBDC experiment with major Switzerland based cryptocurrency bank SIBA conducted in collaboration with SIBA Bank International now a Luxembourg uh, and Luxembourg Central Securities Depository, Lux CSD. The experiment used a CBDC to simulate the settlement and delivery of listed securities on Target 2 Securities, T25, a European securities settlement engine. Now, why this is important is because, uh, I don't know if you guys remember this document. I did a video on this from back in March. Uh, I'll see if I can find it. I'll link it up here if I can find it. Central Bank Digital Currency, CBDCs, a comparative review. Now, this was put out by the CPA of Australia, but uh, this document discussed... Uh, different options surrounding CBDC implementation. And the Bank of France actually directly said that Ripple and XRP were a viable solution for these types of financial applications. Fast forward a few months and now we are seeing the pilots uh, from the Bank of France settling payment transfers in real time. So thought that was really interesting news. I got this from T Hole Betic, guys. Ample transfers. We have been first movers for over 20 years as the first partners of Western Union, MoneyGram, and RIA in Singapore. We're also the first remittance company to have join RippleNet, powering payments in real time using DLT. So this is through Ample Transfers, guys. And they mention it right down here. We are also the first bootstrap remittance company to have joined RippleNet, powering payments in real time using distributed ledger technology. Interesting also to note that these guys have partnered with Western Union, MoneyGram, and RIA in Singapore specifically. Uh, three of the biggest remittance companies around the world, of course. We know that uh, Ripple did have that partnership with MoneyGram. Of course, they had to dissolve that once the SEC lawsuit was brought forth. 
Nevertheless, Ample Transfers running on Ripple. And uh, you guys can see just from their website here some of the partnerships they have with MoneyGram, Indusland Bank, uh, Merchant Trade, MoneyGram, Tranglo, Sacom Bank, Western Union. We also got uh, BCA Bank, BRI, and Commercial Bank here. So great news there. Wanted to thank T-Hole Betic XRP for posting that. And this here from Stefan Hubert, guys, although the page was updated, apparently nothing was filed yesterday. So he tweeted this out a couple of days ago. He's referring to Thursday, last Thursday, although the documents or the letter from the SEC regarding Bitcoin and Ethereum would have been due yesterday. Now, I'm going to return to this a little later in this video. We're going to talk a little bit about a settlement in the case. I know we've talked about that. That's a big kind of topic within the XRP community at this moment. But could there be another outcome, guys? Is there a possibility that the SEC could drop the case altogether. Well, we're going to get into this, and uh, I know you guys know Hester Peirce did an interview recently on Bloomberg News. This from XRP Crypto Wolf here on Twitter, bringing up this AMB Crypto article, just kind of giving us the highlights from that interview. Of course, we know she is Crypto Mom. We know her stance on cryptocurrency. Uh, this time as well, she called out for 100% transparency to boost crypto innovation. In the interview, she talks about this. Here are some quotes with respect to what we're going to do at the SEC. I hope we can provide clarity in a few areas. One would be, I have put Put out a token safe harbor to give some clarity around token distribution events. I think we need to approve an exchange traded product or an ETP based on Bitcoin. And frankly, we've got new applications in based on Ethereum as well. And so uh, Hester Peirce did come up with the three-year safe harbor plan. This article outlines it a little bit here. On the current chairman, Gary Gensler, who has been quite vocal in the past, Peirce opined he has been quite outspoken already about wanting to have some oversight of the spot markets, whether it's the SEC or another federal regulatory agency. And then she was asked about XRP being deemed a security. And guys, here's what she had to say. So that leads to the question, XRP has been on the market for eight years. When does a digital asset become a security or maybe something else? And how does the SEC determine that? Well, I think that is a difficult question. And it's something that I've also, again, tried to get us to, to be a little bit more precise. When we think about a, a crypto asset, a digital asset as being a security, what we're doing is is we're saying that we think it's part, it's being sold as part of an investment contract, um, which means that there are promises being made around the sale of that asset. It doesn't mean that the asset itself necessarily has to be a security. It means that it was being sold as a security. Then the question becomes, at what point can someone sell that asset as a, not as a security? And that is a very difficult line. Okay, I'm going to stop it there. So this debate about when is a security an investment contract and when is it that a company can sell something that isn't deemed a security, What at what point is that line crossed? And I think we see this a lot in the cryptocurrency space. Hester Peirce definitely realizes that this happens. And so XRP might not be a security, according to the SEC commissioner. This coming from Ian Northing here on Twitter. When asked about XRP regulatory status during her recent Bloomberg interview, the U.S. Security and Exchange Commissioner Hester Peirce said that a cryptocurrency doesn't necessarily have to be a security if the issuer gets sued by the agency. So again, just to reiterate, when we think about a crypto asset as being a security, what we're doing is we're saying it's being sold as an investment contract. Again, this is the quote that you just heard from Hester Peirce, which means that there are promises being made around the sale of this asset. It doesn't mean that the asset itself necessarily has to be a security. It means that it was being sold as a security. Peirce believes that the SEC needs to provide more regulatory clarity before the agency spends too much time on non-fraud cases. So Hester Peirce obviously has her opinion about where the SEC uh, should be putting their resources with regards to cryptocurrency clarity. And so there's this question that we have to keep asking ourselves, how strong is the SEC's case? Are they going to settle soon? Do they really have a case considering this whole, is it a security, isn't it a security argument? Are we just muddying the waters because the definition is so wishy-washy? Well, DJ Peter Vass posted this. Uh, is a Ripple settlement coming? And, uh, you know, this is based on Jeremy Hogan's last video. If you guys didn't catch that, he is at Legal Briefs on YouTube. And I have talked about this in a former video, but I just wanted to go over his quote again. No settlement will happen until after the close of Discovery. Could it settle before then? Yes, I just don't think it's likely. So any settlement is likely to be after at least the close of fact discovery, and that is now early September and even more likely to be after October 16th. 
So Jeremy Hogan saying, you know, um, we, we will likely see us, if we do see a settlement, we are likely going to see this settlement at this point in time. So we're thinking at the end of quarter three, 2021 or early quarter four, 2021, he goes on to say, and if it doesn't settle, then I believe the two main issues will be decided by Judge Torres at summary judgment. We know the SEC recently did get an extension, a 60 day extension for their discovery. Jeremy Hogan is suggesting that, you know, now we could see the possibility of a settlement by quarter three, late quarter three, early quarter four of 2021, just based on what we know today. But I also wanted to bring this up for you guys. This is from Dictator Know It All, retweeting out Stefan Hubert's tweet here. Is the end of the lawsuit right around the corner? Now here's what Stefan Hubert discovered. I discovered that Judge Netburn has posted a settlement information sheet on settlements for her own cases. So this is a document created by Judge Netburn back in 2017, giving the key points for her particular cases and how she what her criteria is for settlement so key points one all hearings are strictly confidential and communication is not to be shared with the outside world let me read you some of these highlighted points all settlement conferences are off the record all communications relating to settlement are strictly confidential uh, judge functions as a mediator attempting to help the parties reach a settlement no later than one week before the conference, counsel for each party must send the court a letter marked confidential material for use only at settlement conference. The parties, not just the attorneys, must attend in person. A party's attendance is essential to the settlement process. Uh, up here, where any government agency is a party, counsel of record must be accompanied by a knowledgeable representative from the agency. Uh, the purpose of the presentation is to persuade the opposing party, not the court. And finally, down here, requests submitted more than 14 days before the scheduled conference date will ordinarily be granted without a showing of good cause. Uh, no effect on other deadlines. So that in bold here, unless otherwise ordered, a scheduling of a settlement conference has no effect on any deadlines or other pending obligations in the case. So these are the criteria that Judge Netburn has set out herself in terms of how she deals with settlements of cases. Now, uh, I know some people in this tweet thread were commenting on the date of this this is back from october 2017 it's old news no 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 i don't think you guys get it these are just key points this is just her criteria for any case that she settles so i thought this was interesting stefan hubert also notes some interesting points here negotiations have no bearing on the ongoing case deadlines must be strictly adhered to judge netburn acts as a mediator trying to bring the parties closer together uh this is pretty much in line with the impression i have gotten from her rulings so far a confidential letter must be sent to the court one week before a settlement is to be confirmed by the court. Uh, and number five, at the settlement conference, all parties involved must be present in person. Yes, the document is from 2017. Netburn has been a judge for longer than that, so he's just kind of explaining to some people down here why he uh, decided to post this document from 2017. Uh, and so... Uh, you know, some people down here, Enigma retweeted out this David Schwartz tweet back from May 15th, 2021, uh, probably referred to one of those confidential meetings. I mean, perhaps, although I do think we did attribute this David Schwartz tweet to something else. A lot's going on behind the scenes. You know, we have to take everything into consideration when analyzing all this information, when distilling it down and synthesizing what this all could mean. Now, Stefan Hubert takes it one step further, guys and posted this, posted this just yesterday because somehow it's hardly ever addressed. It wouldn't be the first time that the SEC drops a lawsuit either. So he just did what looks like a simple Google search for all those times that the SEC decided to drop a lawsuit. So SEC drops lawsuit against executive in financial and then it goes on. This is just a screen grab from his Google search. SEC drops lawsuit against ex Thornburg Mortgages CEO. And there's some more results down here. SEC drops lawsuit against BMA in scalping case. So, um, and this is just one page. I'm sure the list goes on and on. So it certainly wouldn't be the first time the SEC decided to drop a case. I'm not saying it's going to be dropped, but history does show that the SEC has dropped cases in the past. So is a settlement incoming or maybe the terms of a settlement are being negotiated or will the SEC drop the lawsuit altogether? We have Hester Peirce coming on Bloomberg News, clearly outlining her thoughts on XRP with relation to the security designation. Meanwhile, the narrative for the entire crypto market not looking so great. Although guys, we do have glimmers of hope cryptocurrency going green, and important organizations pushing government-issued CBDCs, 
rather than private stablecoins. And we know that Ripple and XRP have been chosen by many central banks around the world. So is it just the beginning? Do we have to get through this pain before we see maximum gain? I think we're getting there, but I want to hear what you guys think. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Like the video if you like the content I'm providing. I always love hearing your comments. See you in the next one, guys.